Salve. We are beginning lesson 7, lines 494 to 538. And we've skipped over some lines, so let me recap what's happened right before these lines so we have some context. The last time we left Aeneas, he and Achates viewed Carthage, which was under construction from a top of a hill, and then they're proceeding into the city clothed in this this cloud that Venus put them in, so they are not seen by the other, uh, by the people around them, by the Tyrians, the Carthaginians. Virgil then goes into an ekphrasis in which he describes a grove that the Tyrians found when they settled this colony. And in this grove, there was found, they dug up a head of a war horse. And they took that as an omen foreshadowing success in war. And Dido decided on this site where they found this horse head to build a temple dedicated to Juno. So Aeneas and Achates make their way to this temple. And when they get there, they realize that it has been decorated with friezes or frescoes of the Trojan War. And Aeneas recognizes a lot of the scenes. Some very famous scenes are depicted. Um, the uh, Menelaus and Agamemnon are depicted. Priam, the king of Troy. Achilles there is depicted. There's a, a scene with the king Rhesus, and he, who was killed in his sleep by Diomedes. You might remember Diomedes also almost killed Aeneas. Rhesus was a ally of the Trojans, and he died before he could even go into battle, and his prized horses were, were captured. Also, a youth named Troilus, who uh, was dragged by his chariot, and also they mention Hector being dragged by Achilles around the walls of Troy. Also a scene with the Trojan women uh, in mourning and asking Minerva or Athena for help. Uh, the goddess had refused to give them help and they were making prayers to her. And there's even a scene of an Amazon woman warrior, Penthesilia, who's leading her Amazons into battle. And after Aeneas looks at all these things, uh, he becomes very moved, and we're going to pick up the lines right there where we see him being moved by the scenes. So I'm going to go ahead and read the Latin now. Haec dum dardani aeneiae mirandur videntur, dum stupet ob tutu quaeret defixus in uno, regina templum forma pucerima dido, in cessit magna juvenum stipante caterva. So the subject is these things, haec, these things seem, videntur, comes from video, but when it's in the passive, a lot of times we want to translate this as seem. Let me write it down here for you. So I put it there for you. When in video is in the passive, you can translate it is seen, or you can translate it seem. Videntur, the passive, these things seem. Miranda, to be wondered at by Dardanio Aeneae, by Dardanian Aeneas. And so the Miranda goes with haik, and Dardanio Aeneae goes together. However, Dardanio Aeneae is dative, and I know I translated them as by, but that's because with this particular form, that which is the gerundive, Miranda, they must be wondered, uh, when it takes an agent or someone that's wondering, wondered by Dardanian Aeneas, then we use the dative. It's called the dative of agent, and you use it with this form, the gerundive. So, while these things, and this is neuter plural right here, hike is a way of saying these things. 
If you said hick, it'd be this man. Hike could be this woman. But the same form, hike, can also be these things, either in the nominative or the accusative, so neuter plural. These things. We call that a substantival use of an adjective or pronoun. So these things. While these things seem to be wondered at by Dardanian Aeneas, Farr makes the note that the reason they call him the Dardanian here is because we just looked at a whole bunch of scenes of the Trojan War. So to call him Dardanio, which means Troiano, means Trojan, is very appropriate because he is Trojan. So it connects it back to the lines that we skipped over that I mentioned in which Aeneas is viewing all these friezes in the temple of the Trojan War. And now we have doom again. So we've got some anaphora here. So while, while these things are seen to be wondered at by Dardanian Aeneas, and then comma, there would be an et here, but since we have this anaphora, you don't really need the et. It's, this is like it's signaling a new clause. While he stupid, he is, stands agape, or he's stupefied, kind of like obstupefactus, they're related. And he clings, hyret, fixed, in one view. So all these are kind of saying the same thing, right? He's amazed, he stands agape, he stands fixed in one view. It's a poetic way of describing him. So we've got uh, verbs that Aeneas is the subject of. Both of these, you got to put in a subject, Aeneas. Right? And he's mentioned up here, but the subject of this line is hike, because this is a plural verb, and then these are singular verbs, so the subject is implied Aeneas. And defixus is an adjective that's describing Aeneas. And uno obtutu is ablative. So we'll do blue on those. Ablative. In uno obtutu, in one view. Okay. The queen. In kesit, well, let's read it in Latin. Regina ad templum forma pucheri madido in kesit magna juvenem stipante caterva. The queen, a new subject. She's really the main subject of this sentence because these other ones, this is while he was doing this and while, while these things were being wondered and while he was doing this stuff, the queen approached, okay? So the queen approached. These clauses up here would be dependent clauses because they have the doom and this is the main clause. The queen approached to the temple and then in apposition to the queen, Dido. Like the delay on her name there, it adds some effect. Dido, forma pucherima. Okay, now we have a pucherima modifies Dido. Very beautiful and forma. By her form or by her shape or by her beauty with respect to her form or beauty. Very beautiful with respect to her form. And she is, uh, okay, now this last part right here describes her, but it's, a, it's an ablative absolute. So let's just take this whole thing as one it's ablative absolute phrase. And it has with a magna katerwa, with a great crowd, of what kind of people? Of Uenum. The great crowd of young men. Stipante. Thronging about. And that's also ablative. So see, you have an ablative absolute. It just is a descriptor, descriptive clause that's added on the sentence. Uh, and it's all in the ablative except for that genitive right there. With a great crowd of young men crowding about, or thronging about. And usually an ablative absolute has a noun, there it is, in the ablative, and then a participle in the ablative, and there it is. And then this noun happens to have an adjective describing it too, with a great crowd of young men.
crowding about. And usually a good way to translate ablative absolutes, in this case it's a present active participle here, so in this case we translate it with the noun participling, okay, with the crowd crowding, or with the crowd thronging, and then we just add on our other stuff, with the great crowd of young men crowding.